Ghosts, ghouls, specters, poltergeists, spirits. Many names have been given to the presence that can be seen or felt or smelled, but is it real? Or do we just enjoy scaring ourselves? Join us, Amelia and Beth, two cousins trying to figure out history's bumps in the night. Is it residual energy, ghosts, time loops, angels? We're not going to do any demons, though. We're here to hear all your best ghost stories in the region and look back at some of the area's favorite legends. So join us and our EMF readers as we try to decipher possible EVPs and talk to some experts in the paranormal realm. You can find us on Insta or Twitter at Ghost Hunting in New England or email us ghosthuntinginnewengland at gmail.com. Don't forget to click subscribe and get ready for your new favorite spooky podcast. Welcome to Ghost Hunting in New England. Bye. All right, are we almost ready to get started? Do you want some Tylenol? No. I, 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 I already had to take... I really don't like taking Tylenol, and I had to take some today. Okay. So my jaw's still really messed up. And what does the dentist say now? Because it's been like two weeks. They suck it up, buttercup. No, they didn't. Yeah, they did. No, they didn't. Uh, yes, they did. You can call my dentist. And let me, why don't I get my giant bag of pens I was going to say, how about we get the pens out before we get going? <laughs> Do you want to start or do you want me to start? I want you to start. Go. Great. Okay. So, <laughs> well, hold on. Okay. Hello and welcome to this week on Ghost Hunting in New England. I'm your co host, Amelia. And I'm Beth. And we here, as we are every week or so, here to talk to you about all things spooky going on in the New England region. We do not have a person interview today. Today we're going over stories and we're going to go over a ghost hunt that we recently just did in the rain. (laughs) And when she says recently, she means like (laughs) we are literally still wet from being in the rain. (laughs) Soaked. Uh, this is within the hour, and so we're going to actually listen to our EVPs right here for the very first time before we've listened to them in the car, but we thought it'd be kind of fun to go to over it all with you guys. do it live. Yeah. Does live count on a podcast? Um, no, unless it's a live podcast. I was going to correct it, but... That's okay. <laughs> we decided, you know... We're going to do it in real time. Real time. That's perfect. That's exactly what it is. Real time. So to start, we're going to go over... The Powder House here in Somerville. For those of you who don't know, we do record at the Somerville Media Center in Union Square, Somerville. There's a donut house around the corner that calls my name. Union Square Donuts. And they have vegan donuts and they are delicious. And Beth brought me some at work last week and it was awesome. I also may have eaten them in the car on the way to Amelia's work and on the way home. And I have to go buy bigger pants. I was going to say the same thing. It completely ruined my diet. But we're not here to talk about donuts. We're here to talk about ghosts. So, um, although powder, powder donuts, we, we can make all these correlations. Mm-hmm. So, what we did earlier today is we went to the Powder House in Somerville, in Powder House Square, rightfully named. So, the Powder House was built in around 1703 by the French Protestant shipbuilder Jean Millet on land which was then known as Two Penny Brook Quarry. So during the time, the structure functioned not as a gunpowder storage facility, but rather as a windmill for the Malay farm. In 1747, the Malay family sold their land to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, where the windmill structure was utilized as a gunpowder magazine. On September 1st, 1774, the Powder House found itself in the center of one of the most pivotal events leading up to the American Revolution. General Thomas Gage landed with British troops at the Ten Hills Farm on Mystic River, whereupon they marched up Broadway and seized about 250 barrels of gunpowder that were being stored at the former Malay farm. This event marked the first act of aggression by the British towards the colonies and consequently triggered the powder alarm, where many individuals from surrounding villages prepared to march to Boston for battle, though their actions proved to be premature. Okay, so in 1818, the Massachusetts Bay Colony sold the land to Peter Tufts, later inherited by... Nathan Tupps, for whom the surrounding park is named, during which time the Powder House was incorporated into Powder House Farm. Moreover, the building was also used as storage facility for old Powder House brand pickles. And we saw a little tribute to them up there. 
The structure and surrounding land was finally sold to Somerville in 1892 for the price of $1. And for those of you interested in what $1 was worth in 1892, it was $27. Still a good deal. One of my friends actually lives about two blocks from there in an apartment that she told me yesterday is on the market for a million dollars. God it's bless a them. Three bedroom house with like no parking, no nothing, a million dollars. And that's in 2019 dollars. So my grandmother grew up in Somerville and she always kind of box when she goes on these trips and meets up with people from Cambridge because they always call it Slummerville. Mm-hmm. And it's a rude thing to say to someone who grew up there. Mm-hmm. And she always jokes. She's like, well, you know what? If you had picked up and decided to move there and kept your property, you'd be multimillionaires by now. So anyway, the land was converted into a park designed by Mr. Eaton, where the old powder house was renovated and repaired. The old mill still stands today. And here's where we get into the stuff we want to get into. Uh, it was a site of hauntings for decades, but it's not a ghost from the Revolutionary War that lingers. Instead, it's a ghost of an angry father. Before the war, a poor farmer used the windmill as a secret place to meet with the wealthy man's daughter with whom he was in love, and the couple knew the father would strongly disapprove of their relationship. The father became suspicious when he noticed his daughter was spending many nights at the mill and the idle town gossip eventually made its ways to his ears and confirmed not only his suspicions, but the young couple's suspicions that the father would not approve, because he didn't. The father then went and devised a plan to surprise the lovers at the windmill and to embarrass and punish them. But the couple saw him approaching, and the daughter told the young farm boy to hide as she climbed into the mill's loft. As she did this, the movement from her dress caught her father's eye. He stormed into the mill cursing, and he tried to adjust his eyes to see inside, but was unable to, so he was just kind of in there groping around. His daughter backed off from the stairs, hoping to evade her father, but she tripped on a loose floorboard. She threw out her arm and grasped a rope in an attempt to steady her fall, but the weight of her body tugged on the rope and set off the mill's fan blades in motion. She heard her father cry out in agony. She rushed down the stairs as her lover left his hiding place, and the young couple found the father withering about on the floor. When the blade started, he had been standing on one of the millstones. The sudden jerk had thrown him into the cranks. His arm was caught between the grinding surfaces and crushed to a pulp. The two young lovers picked him up and carried him home, but he died shortly after. As he lay there dying, he saw how foolish his behavior had been, and he gave his permission to his daughter to marry the farmer. But it was kind of sad because she just saw her father die in this horrific way. So kept delaying the wedding. Um, I can't find any accounts that say whether or not they did get married or any names from this. But she never went to the mill again, especially because after that, people kept hearing her father's ghost. So on windy nights especially, which is part of the reason we went today because it's very, very windy here in Somerville, his profanity was so filthy that you can hear it, and also it is said in this legend it became visible in the form of blue lights dancing and exploding about the building. And so a lot of this story, where it was originally written down, and it's been told many times in the area, but the original account comes from Myth and Legends of Our Own Land, which was written in 1896 by Charles Skinner. As I was doing research on this and kind of going through all these archives, there were a lot of people saying they saw the blue lights. So some people say the blue lights are his profanity kind of manifesting. They say it's like the spirits dancing. A lot of people, however, say it is, and we've talked about this on the show before, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it many times, but one of those time loops that you can get stuck in. And so people, some people think that the blue lights are actually from gunshots that happened there. They think it's kind of this time loop of things from the Revolutionary War, which is interesting. Um, So yeah, this is a local legend here in Somerville, and we went to investigate today. Beth, what are your thoughts? It was very rainy. It was very rainy. It It definitely was very rainy. It was very, but it was very windy, which is what you want if you're, if the wind picks up profanity. Uh... I was not aware that I was supposed to be listening for profanity. Um, 
I, I find that would be the type of thing that I would have heard um, out of nowhere, been like, did you just hear some guy yell the F word? Um, but then again, we are right next to a major rotary in um, in Somerville at that park, so I probably would have just attributed it to traffic. So it's interesting you say that, because there actually was an article I read, and it was a very well-written article, in um, one of the local Somerville papers, The Patch, where they said the same thing, where it's totally not uncommon to be in this area by that rotary in Somerville and hear profanity. And that's just, mm-hmm. <laughs> and maybe that's, you know, again, like attracts like, and there's just a lot of profanity going on, and that's why that's there. So if you're familiar with the area, it's right over by the College Ave Rotary by Tufts University in uh, Medford in Somerville. And it's it's this terrible rotary that has like 14 different entrances and exits. And there's people on bicycles and there's a bus stop right in the middle of it. It's like the best thing ever. It Yeah, it, it really kind of embodies every stereotype of Boston driving. Yes. <laughs> and then you throw in a rotary on top of right. it. Right. Yeah. If you want to um, get... You know, killed, killed, or <laughs> it's a, a good place a good, to walk through at rush a hour. A <laughs> really good lesson in how to drive in Massachusetts. Just drive <laughs> over to this spot and see if you can hear a ghost. Um, okay, so yeah, that's the story. And now, so I think it's so interesting that she was climbing up into the top of the tower. And kind of like groping around to like find something to steady yourself on. And the amount of time that she and, what was it, the farmer? Yep. Had spent there makes me just really kind of wonder about like, did she not know like how all the stuff in there worked? Did she not know that there was this giant, um, what did you call it? Uh, It wasn't a windmill. It was what? Uh, It was mill blades. It was the mill blades that were going to, you know, like mangle her father. So... I kind of thought about that too and how I understand it is like these and I it, it kind of reminded me of Princess Bride which is why I, I wrote Farm Boy in here a few times so oh, I love okay. that line but you know they're going to meet in secret so if you're going to meet your lover in secret you're not like I wouldn't know anything about that cl- <laughs> that's not her husband early in life <laughs> so if you know if you're going you know you're not going to be exploring the mill. You're going to be making out by the front door. You know? I don't know. I'm, just, I guess I'm more adventurous. You just, well, you but, know. But I, get, I would always have Sean with me to go exploring and adventuring. So I, Right. This wouldn't be like your one shot to see Sean. It, you know, it might be different if, mm-hmm. you know, it was, you know, a secret love affair. It's very romantic. I okay. think it's romantic. It's very romantic. So anyway, so what happened is... Uh, they, other than the whole, like, she killed her dad thing. That right? part is not so romantic. <laughs> but, you know, up until then, it sounds like they were having a very nice love affair. But then, you know, so they're there, you know, they're canoodling, whatever. And then she looks out, she sees her dad approaching. And it's at the top of a hill. Yeah, I was going to say that. It's at the top of a hill, so you would be able to see that. And then she tells... The boy just hide, hide mm-hmm. in these rocks or whatever. And she just starts climbing, presumably to hide from her dad. Right. So I, I think it's fair to say she's probably panicked. She's pro- I mean, think about how women were treated at that time to be canoodling with a farmer boy and you're very wealthy. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not, this isn't. So it's it's like the original horror story line of the monster is coming, quick run up the stairs. <laughs> right, right, yes. So, you know, they can't see anything. Obviously, this is in the 1700s. It's not like there's electricity. They can't just mm-hmm. turn the lights on. So she's just running up there in the dark and slips and grabs onto the first thing near her and it's a sad en- story. engages the mill blades and that was all she wrote. It was what it was. Right. We had planned and we had booked the studio for tonight and we were going to come in and do some of our ghost stories and it's been pouring in Boston all day. And, you know, Amelia and I are like, you know, living our lives. Believe it or not, no one pays us to do this podcast thing. So we're, we're doing yet. our thing. And, no, not, not yet. yet. Not yet. We're looking for that um, sponsorship from Union Square Donuts. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, she sends me a message and she's like, oh, we have to go meet at this park. And I was like, well, oh, it's raining. Like, what are you talking about? She's like, we're not going to melt. We're not, <laughs> we're not witches. witches. Yeah, it's it's fine. And I'm like, but but I don't have an umbrella. She goes, well, I have an umbrella and I have a raincoat. I'm like, damn it, I have a raincoat too. I guess we're going. <laughs> so 
here we are. So